give up. I never give up. I never give up. Hi guys, welcome back to Neff Inspiration, my show on YouTube and as a podcast with me, your host, Stefan Neff. I am excited to have Greg Elliott with me today. Greg Elliott is a man who has uh, tried to find ways how to, to uh, measure at uh, our health in a more modern way. There's so many health measures like your weight, your BMI, your all kind of things. And people try to, to use those measures to as surrogate measures to predict, well, what's our health like? What's our maybe health span? Our lifespan is like, et cetera. So many things, but these surrogate measures are often pretty crap in all fairness. As a doctor, I can admit to that. Um, but Greg and I both have uh, have realized that there are more modern things there, um, and modern variables give us certain certain information that was previously not there, and certainly not in the quality that. And today we deep dive into HRV, uh, which is basically heart rate variability. And it sounds uh, okay, highly, highly medical, but no, we won't make make it so medical. But we allow you to to get a glimpse of how you can use modern variables, um, modern technology to actually get a better finger on the pulse, literally in this case. And I'm looking forward to talk to Greg. Welcome to my show. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here. I love obviously everything you, you've been doing up to this point. Uh, it's such an inspiration for, for everybody. So thank you. And I'm very excited to be here. Absolutely. Wow. Heart rate variability. You can't get more, more specific. That is just, <laughs> but I think we need to lay the land. Uh, so to, to, to actually say, well, okay, what the hell are we talking about here? <laughs> I mean, in, in simple terms, we all know, okay, our heart is in there in our chest and it beats and sometimes it beats a bit bit stronger. And that's that's about the extent that most people actually know about it. Um, I did quickly some calculations and it's a crazy amount of uh, about about three trillion times your heart will beat in a lifetime uh, and that's crazy. And But it's not like a metronome. It doesn't go clack. But no, um, the, the changes, the rhythms of the heart change with your whole overall state. And that is what we are talking about, this heart rate variability. So having set the scene there, now why the hell should we talk about something so specific? Clearly, that is way beyond 99.9% .9 of the population. Yeah, I know it's, it's, uh, it, it's been the last decade of, of me diving deep into utilizing heart rate variability to kind of see its its power uh of to what it can actually what it can actually do and, and for a long long time in front of medical professionals people were looking at me with you know uh, uh wonderment of what i was saying that it's actually true or not when it comes to heart rate variability and i you know doing the presentations and doing podcasts now it's 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 great to the fact that i don't have to educate people or get those kind of blank stares from 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 medical professionals anymore uh, still not you know from the generalized population still learning to go there but it's been a wonderful discovery for technology and be able to put you know agency into people's health through the uh, calculating this biometric and uh and we'll kind of get dive into to how you can use this to to better understand your your health and well-being Indeed. And I think this is something that we really only have seen in the last probably 10 years um, coming more out with the, uh, with the easier availability of variables such as uh, now quick, quick stating here, I do not get any uh, advertisement fees from anyone. Uh, so if I use a brand name, then it's just what I wear because I like it for reasons whatsoever. Okay, end of the story. <laughs> non, non, uh, disclosure statement done. Um, I use a Garmin. Um, I like it because it gives me a hell of a lot of information and it has heart rate variability. And these are beautiful things. But often enough, most of us don't know what to do with it. Um, so yeah, yeah, where, where did your journey sure. where did your journey start? Where where how did you get into that field? Yeah, so my master's thesis, I, I, uh, I attended Bloomsbury University in, in Pennsylvania, and my master's uh, thesis was non-invasive ways of, of measuring heart function. Mm, and so we're validating various technologies to measure um, the heart during exercise 
specifically. Um, so I got introduced to Harvey variability then and, and then and, and relatively now as well. There's not much utility of heart rate variability during exercise. So I didn't necessarily include it into my paper, but I was informed about it all and, and to, it, it, to its value. Um, and so when I came back home, I'm from Vancouver, Canada, and I came back home here, um, people started talking about heart rate variability from a sports performance standpoint. And so, uh, and a lot of the companies were just coming out now, and and that was you know Omega Wave, BioForce, uh, iFleets in the UK. And so there's a few companies um, that were that are allowing consumers to measure heart rate variability. And so I got curious as to why this is, and um, but luckily uh, I you know at that time not a lot of people were doing it. So uh, the people that were creating these companies are very accessible. So I was able to communicate with them back and forth and sort of get information, educate myself on on the utility of it all. Got a few friends uh, on it to measure and found out some wonderful things of what it is and uh, what it can do and and really what it's what it's rooted in was was kind of the the confusion for a lot of people in the sports performance realm where they they're using it for training uh, specifically and they thought well this is a it tells me when a good day is to train mm. or not and it's like well that's a piece of it but really not the essence of what that heart rate variability actually is mm. so. Let's explain it a little bit more. So, guys, careful. Um, physiology uh, ahead. So, it's we need to go a little bit into the, the what it is and actually how it is measured because there are certain certain um, there's a certain complexity there. But we try to keep it as simple as possible. Uh, Craig, take it away. Um, how what do we look at when we talk about the, the differences between heartbeats? Yes. So, I how I explain this is this is that everyone knows heart rate. We know 60 beats per minute, 90 beats per minute. Everyone's very familiar with that mm -hmm. process. But what we're finding is that there's significantly a lot more information that we, that we can derive from the frequency at which those beats occur. So as you stated, a heart doesn't beat like a metronome. It's not super consistent. It varies over time. Mm -hmm. um, and, and at rest, we, this is typically where we, we look at heart rate variability the most is when, when, when we're completely at, at rest uh, rather than being active. And at rest... You know, when your heart rate beats like a metronome, where it's super consistent. So say it's 60 beats per minute. Mm -hmm. If it's on the second every single second, our body is in a unhappy, unhealthy, stressed state. When our heart rate varies at rest, where it goes up, it speeds up and slows down in this nice rhythmic mm -hmm. pattern, our body is in a happy, healthy, well state. That is the essence of heart rate variability. We want more variability. And, and I always, would, when I would state this, when I said that I, I get a lot of confusions because typically we, we consider health to be something that's relatively stable in the presence of something that our body maintains a stable environment, homeostasis, yeah. right? All these things that we can maintain. Some, so people go, well, that's counterintuitive to what you would think as to what it is. But we want more variability uh, into the heart. It's in, in the reason why I like it so much and why I've kind of dived into this significantly is the fact that I find it to be one of the best whole health biomarkers. It looks at all the major components of health. It looks at biological health, psychological health, and social health. If you have any type of conditions or abnormalities in those specific areas, you'll see a decrease in people's heart rate variability, which I really like it. But then lies the complexity of interpreting it is the fact that all these variables then will impact heart rate variability. So you cannot have it not, it can't be diagnosed it is looking at whole health just because you have great biological health doesn't necessarily mean that you are a truly <laughs> healthy person. Absolutely. And so that's why I like this. It gives insights deeper into the, the whole person and not just one specific area of, of health and well-being. Absolutely love that answer. Thank you. That was a beautiful, beautiful summary of it. Um, equally, I mean, you are coming from a sports physiology point of view and from a health Hacking point of view, and which is fantastic. That's what I what has my interest as well. But from a doctor's point of view, uh, heart rate variability can also be a measure of disease. For example, um, that what we need to explain where this variability comes from, and it's from the complex interaction of the sympathetic nervous system, fight, flight, freeze, and the parasympathetic nervous system, the relax, heal, time to look after yourself part of our lives and they both have an important role to play and they both impact on the heart and the heart rate variability now if the nerves these are all nerves that we're talking about if these nerves are fried by 
um, are destroyed or harmed by either conditions or other situations, um, then that will no longer apply. For example, diabetes is a, a disease that unfortunately does harm such nerves. And it can be a marker that um, uh, um, the lack of heart rate variability can be a marker that there is actually a, a biological disease uh, in action. So, yeah. but we that let's accept that for what it is. So the heart rate variability might not necessarily be be a, a, a correct reflection of what we are talking about in absolutely everyone. So let's park that though aside uh, and actually talk about really a, a relatively healthy uh, person. Um, and I love the way that you said that because you we nowadays understand in functional medicine that there are so many influences that is a, a very complex web that that affects us uh, that uh, that uh, affects our uh, sympathetic nervous system specifically and refs us up there and it is all those those domains that uh, the the biological emotional mental health that actually comes in there so it is actually an excellent marker to say a global marker hey hang on there's something seriously wrong at the moment and you might be a strapping young man testosterone flowing out of every pore you're looking good in the mirror and your heart rate variability says oh for fuck's sake <laughs> zero chance that you train today yeah no absolutely and and you and you hit the nail on the head when you talk about you know in the disease states and that's the when when people come to me for for consultations or they're monitoring heart rate variability and and, and we look at kind of the normative data and they don't fall within their typical demographic um the first thing i do is like you need to see a doctor and get blood work done like we gotta we gotta make sure there's no medical problems first that is mm -hmm. that is primary if you haven't had blood work done or you had a checkup like that is the first thing you're doing no if ands or buts so that's always my first uh, process because again, like if someone has those type of conditions, mm. I'm not going to tell them to to do a lot of interventions because we have to have a handle on on the disease state first. Mm. And so that's always my my, my primary uh, mm. uh, objective. Uh, but yes, like you're completely right, and I think it's it's why um, heart rate variability hasn't been too clinically involved uh, up to this point mm. is because if we deal in the health with silos, it makes it very hard for practitioners to utilize it. So I'll use the example of a, a physical therapist, right? Mm. They have specific tools that they utilize, but if someone's heart rate variability is low, right? And they want to use it clinically, it, it more than likely may fall out of their scope of practice of what they're designed specifically Absolutely. to do. So it makes it really hard unless you're involved with some sort of clinic and it's systematically uh, done where it's been a part of your clinic and you can kind of utilize it a little bit more. Very into like our clinic in, in Vancouver, we have medical doctors, naturopathic doctors, uh, TCM nice. doctors, nice. physical therapy. We, we have this team around us and we use this information like, hey, let's we need to use the team to be involved. I'm not going to solve every problem uh, that every individual has. But let's make sure that we're doing everything we possibly can and, and let's use the subjective feedback to determine if we're making the right decisions. Mm. Cool, 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 cool. Um, we have already now said, okay, yes, there, it's good to be variable. Um, but the, the, the problem, of course, is that uh, nature has got so many rhythms going um in us so we need to talk clearly about the circadian rhythms and also uh, rhythms within the heart rates and within the heart rate variability take us a bit away there because that clearly has an, an impact on on when we measure how we measure how long we measure um etc yeah absolutely and this is another thing when you look at the literature is is you know um things were different time frames different times different length different devices you know, when we talk about heart rate variability, and I think this has been lost a little bit sometimes, is that, you know, true heart rate variability is done with an ECG, right? So this is uh, the, the, we need the, the R to R intervals into what's going on. From the wrist-based or light-based wearables, it's pulse rate variability. It's a little bit, it's the same kind of thing we're looking at when those, those things occur. There's a little bit of nuances in, into those. So there's the, the measurement piece of it all. So obviously literature primarily when they talk about heart rate variability, it's done through, through ECG, which you can't just bring home and take it with you, right? Yeah. People are going to take thousands of dollars, you know, with them and take it all and, and, and at that specific time. So it was, it was hard to, to get kind of continuous. So people would show up, 
Uh, they would sit down in the lab, they would rest for five minutes, and they would take a five-minute reading. So a lot of the data at this point is specifically geared upon that. But mm -hmm. you're completely right. Based on the circadian rhythm, where we are at the time of day, all these things are going to play into our into our measurements of, of heart rate variability. Mm -hmm. So how it's measured now is, is there's a, a few ways that that's measured. Um, the more common way for consumers is that it's nocturnal. So it's through the through the nighttime. So a lot of the wearables now whether it's Garmin, and, and I'll preface to say as well, I have no uh, um, uh, affiliation with any of these wearable products, and I don't, you can buy, or use whatever you want. I, I have no uh, incentive to, to recommend anything, uh, but uh, with the Garmin watches, the Oura rings, the, the Whoop bands, primarily when they 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 show your, your heart rate variability is through the nighttime. That's that's the, the, the primary one. Hmm. What used to be done consumer-wise was uh, a moment in time. And this would be first thing in the morning. So the way that Omega Wave did it, BioForce did it, um, uh, Elite HRV, which become more predominant apps back in the 2010s, uh, where a lot of consumers started to use it. You would wake up, you would part, you put on a, a a heart rate strap, typically a Polar or whatever it may be. You would open the mobile application, you would select go, you lay back down, you would take your measurement at that moment in time. Right. Uh, and then uh, the last way would be more in the moment in itself, and it can, that can be utilized uh, for various uh, various aspects, right? It can be done in a laboratory setting. You know, you set a specific time, or you get people uh, in and do various measurements, mm -hmm. or the fact of psychotherapists use it for coherence training around affecting the nervous system and, and to guide their treatment interventions uh, in the moment of looking at heart rate variability as as you're going through ver various um, uh, techniques. Uh, uh, and interventions from there and see what's happening in the moment. Do you, what do you respond to, don't respond to? How does your nervous system react to various things? And so they use it for, for that, using the breath work to calm down. And so those are the different ways uh, that, uh, and I always say to people, like, well, what's the best way to measure really in, in kind of in real life? It's whatever you can do consistently, hmm. really. It does. I find that, again, based on circadian rhythm, way but, but it is very consistent. It's like, we can find a consistent way to do it. It's 8 o'clock every day. It's 9 o'clock every day. It's through the night. It's this, it's that. I had a client for a long period of time. Every time he woke up, he said the first thing that he did, and this is back before wearables, the first thing he did was that he had to listen to jazz music and sip his coffee. And I go, all right, if, if you do that every single time, I guess that's what, the, what our reference range is. Now, I won't be able to compare that to normative data, but exactly. I can compare that information to him and yeah. if we're on the right track and things like that so exactly. that's the way it is exactly and i think that is that is a, a very lovely way of putting it uh in all measurements that you take in your life um it is more the trend rather than an absolute value and even if it isn't if you look at only on a value you need to look at the value in a in a larger scheme of things not just as oh there's one thing and that's I will base all my decision making now on that one value. So that's a pitfall that sometimes people feel uh, uh, fall into, especially patients fall into. We doctors are a bit more careful, or we healthcare professionals. And, and with that, I'm, I mean, I, I, I wrap it really white because you're so right. Um, we are often cross training in sport. <laughs> we are also cross training or cross pollinating uh, in the various health sciences. And that is the, exactly the way it should be. So we've got a far better understanding of what other uh, allied professionals or what other, other aspects or uh, facets of medicine actually do. And then we can um, uh, employ a far better constructive uh, effort to help a patient. So now it's beautiful. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's, and that's where you're, you're seeing these trends in, into these clinics and these facilities that are becoming, mm -hmm. and I, 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 I never liked the word multidisciplinary because mm -hmm. uh, to me, you know, a lot of people, they'll have a lot of professions under one roof, mm -hmm. but that they're their own type of professionals. And so it really takes what we call an in, the, the interdisciplinary type of group where you're working together, right? Correct. On specific things. And the number one thing I say to patients when they come into my office the very first time, doing these assessments is, you know, like I always tell you, I'm mainly going to assess today. I'm not going to do a lot of things. I'm going to be able to talk and do a bunch of assessments because I want to make sure you're in the right room. Right. Nice. Nice. I have certain, I have certain things that I can deal with. I have a certain okay. skill set, certain scope, but there's a lot of things that I can't, but I surround myself with individuals that can step in when necessary. And that's what nice. I want to make sure of is that the fact that my nice. interventions are the right time for you right now, based on what, what the person is in front of me. Perfect. Uh, lovely way. So we've we've dived a bit into the part of uh, the physiology, the pathophysiology. So the the physiology is when when things are normal. Pathophysiology means when there is a disease around that affects things. Um, we've 
talked a bit about the physics without going nuts in there. So that's cool. So now, really, let's go to the, to to what your daily life is like. I mean, which kind of patients come to you, and do you call them patients or do you call them clients or what? You know, how what is your your school of thought? Yeah, yeah, it's it's. I call them clients because they're part of the process, right? To me, um, I just patients are more of the you know understanding the the term uh, from that standpoint, and so. Uh, but I call you know their their clients to me, um, uh-huh. and so day to day I'm 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 in the clinic about two days a week um, doing that. I also do a lot of consultations for people uh, as well for for heart rate variability. But from the from the clinic perspective, majority of people that come see us uh, are the we call the people with invisible illnesses. So those are the people with fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue syndrome, long COVID anxiety, PTSD, those type of conditions. Beautiful. Where wearable technology and the biofeedback that's available through through wearable technology right now provides a significant amount of of evidence for people uh, that are going through this and some sort of evidence. Like the one thing we always hear when we get people with wearable products and, you know, as you know, with these conditions over periods of time, how it affects the nervous system, right? And so they've, they've been dealing with these these issues for 5, 10, 15, sometimes 20 years since what's going on. And so when we get them on their 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 wearables uh, and we get this kind of, you know, baseline amount of information, it provides a lot of justification because these numbers are abnormal. You know, they, they're not what we expect. And so then they go, OK, great. Like I have something that tells me objectively that there's something because up to that point, every blood work, every doctor, every scan has said that they're fine. So this provides a justification into, okay, there's something I can see that there's some sort of metric that I can work from to be able to improve upon. And the, and the thing that I say is this number is what we need. This is, again, reflective of your you know, overall stress levels, your nervous system, the state of your health and well-being. And we're going to impact this value among others, but HRV being one of those, those numbers, mm-hmm. that we can impact this. This can improve we, to go to where we are. And that provides them to the point of, okay, great. There's something that can be done. I have a number now or numbers that I can utilize to say, Hey, you know, am I doing the right type of interventions? Am I doing the right things? Am I trending in the right direction Mm -hmm. to give that validity? And as they start to impact this number from an objective standpoint, the health agency that they get from that saying, Hey, I can actually influence my health for so long has been taken away from me. It feels out of my control. We now put the control into their shoes, right? They, they have this by doing certain things, whether it's a small change in their diet, a small change in regards to meditation or their sleep habits or something that can impact their health. They go, Oh my, I didn't know I could do that. This is you know motivational. And I want to be able to keep going. Beautiful. And that is a, such a powerful uh, position to be, to move from the victim state to the survivor, when you actually can take action, when you can actually do something. And from that, you can become the, tri- the thriver. Um, absolutely. I love that. And that is exactly the, the, the kind of post-traumatic growth or post-disease growth that we love to see and, and want to encourage. Oh, fantastic. And well, when it comes to, to heart rate variability, um, is uh, are the figures or the, the kind of norms are they actually really set uh is are they the same for males females what about non-binary what about um the various races in the world um are there are there uh, differences because is that yeah. what's really as intelligent as we like it to be yeah that's yeah no so the <laughs> quick answer is no um it's not as intelligent as we would like it to be um, but are there differences? Absolutely. Uh, mm-hmm. And so this is where everything's in, in, in regards to context, right? And so you, you have a general sense as to what's going on, where people are. Yes, male and female differ in there. Now, I'll speak kind of like in generalities, more, let's say, we'll, let's say nocturnal numbers, and we'll, we'll talk about, uh, you know, kind of in the moment numbers from there. There are differences from male to female. Those start to mitigate and start to be able to be uh, less uh, of, of a factor uh, once you say age, age 60. That seems to be, they tend to be pretty darn uh, similar at age 60 comparatively between male and female. Obviously, with age decreases uh, uh, from there. Uh, we haven't looked, uh, I haven't seen anything in regards to non binary uh, side right now. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, in regards to, to, to normal values, mm. uh, ethnicities uh, and races in different parts of the, the world. Um, it's interesting. I don't, there are some differences, but one of the intriguing things that I've seen 
that uh, people that are, are further north from the equator where there's a significant amount of seasonal change, uh, you definitely see seasonal HRV fluctuations. Makes sense. Makes right. sense. Yeah. So it, it all depends on, you know, that type of stuff. So there's that, that kind of contextual cool. information. Cool. There seems to be, you know, they, they've, I've seen some, some studies in regards to countries and they look relatively on the same uh, uh, values uh, as uh, across that. But I think depending on location uh, where it is, uh, we have some normative values uh, from that. And then you have a lot of these kind of uh, private companies out there that kind of show out, you know, what their watches are calculating and what their information is sure. calculating. So you start to see now those are obviously skewed uh, primarily because people that, uh, you know, you start to look at, um, you know, this type of data, people that are utilizing these type of wearables are probably more concerned about their health. So their numbers are probably higher than average, which you you see in the literature that the Absolutely. numbers of specific ages and genders and and, and all that. Um, are a little bit different, but there are some normative values that are out there. Mm-hmm. And so I have an idea based on certain characteristics, whether they're a former athlete or not an athlete, not very physically active, uh, uh, what their um, body composition is like, what their family history is like. You have an idea of kind of where they should be, but very much to you, it's not a diagnostic thing. People can have surprise me all the time. And so, yes, you're very true. It's about the trends of these numbers. It's Absolutely. about, hey, you're starting here, right? And, and I would say, like, this is your number. I'm saying, you're coming to me with, with this number. And we know there's some sort of problem. Hmm. You're in pain. You have, you're have you f- overly fatigued for some reason. There's something going on with your physical or mental health that's an issue. And we're using more, this number, m- among others, but as a proxy, making sure that we're trending in the right direction uh, into what's going on. And so each one of those numbers is individual for, for the person. We, we treat it as an individual thing uh, from there. But our goal is to be able to, to look at that and try to be able to improve upon it, specifically if there's symptoms, which again, that's why we get involved into, into various cases because there's some sort of symptom that that is not normal for them. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. That makes a lot of sense. Um, and indeed, it, it just highlights indeed trends are far more important than an absolute Absolutely. number. Exactly. Perfect. Absolute perfect. Um, give us some examples um, where um, you have seen uh, patients who were clinically clearly in trouble, um, maybe some case vignettes, um, and uh, where then a interdisciplinary approach um, was helping and where you could maybe where you were able to m- use heart rate variability as a sort of uh, delineating uh, a proof, a proof of concept kind of thing. Yeah. So, I mean, the the amount of cases that I've had, and I'd say probably one of the biggest ones that has helped is people suffering from fibromyalgia. Um, You know, a lot of the people have the justification. And I think, and I think one of the things that's been, you know, super impactful is poor coping mechanisms and understanding their impact for people. Alcohol being one of them. A lot of people that suffer from chronic pain have some sort of coping mechanism, sometimes substance abuse that, that they utilize with. And I think I think people understand that it's probably not the best thing to do. They understand it's like it's not, but it helps me. They kind of justify it in that standpoint. And I have one case in particular that she um, was an on and off alcoholic for 15 years, trying to be able to deal with the, the fibromyalgia pain. Knew it wasn't positive, but she's like, I don't know what else to, to, to do. And, and she's trying all sorts of things. We got her on a wearable tracking heart rate variability. And um, within a month and a half, she, we had a session. She goes, I knew alcohol was bad. I didn't know it was this bad for me. <laughs> and it's in October 31st of last year. So almost a year was her last drink. <laughs> Beautiful. When you can actually and she's measure half her, half her pain medication. Uh, she's able to get out and socialize more and be with friends. Oh, um, you know, she's she able to increase her physical activity, sleep through the night. So it's like that kind of understanding of, of her, her, her choices and her behaviors, how much it actually was, was impacting her, her health and well-being. That's one of the more ones dear to my, my heart in that yeah. standpoint, because, you know, it's, it's intriguing and you get this a lot too, where they, you know, they kind of thank you for, for that. And it's like, it wasn't, it wasn't me. Like you made the change. You made the realization. It was you that did all these things. It's you that are, that that you started to, and, and doing all that stuff. I just was there for long for the ride. I was I was a a, a facilitator. I didn't fix anything. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Uh, 
And these are exactly the, the, the kind of cases that I can see where that uh, is a very valuable tool. And the, uh, the, the value is really in giving the control back to the client. Uh, and, and it is not us doing things to them. It's us showing them a way and showing them a way how to measure more objectively their improvement rather than, oh, yeah, that feels good or oh, that didn't feel so good. No, I love that. I absolutely love that. Um, yeah, but that's like I said to me, you know, I ble- I knew this early on is is that, you know, agency to me, giving people back that power control and that confidence mm. uh, of, of, you know, of being able to create that change is... I, I sat with practitioners that are charging a thousand dollars an hour. I've char- I, I sat with practitioners that charge fifty dollars an hour, and I'm telling you right now, one of the biggest things that gets people better overall is 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 in in getting that agency up in individuals that show how much power they actually have. Is that hope yeah. and that belief to overcome what's going on? That's the biggest difference between the the. It has nothing to do with the skills that they have, or the better yeah. diagnostics, or that type of stuff. It has nothing to do with that. Yeah. It's about that interpersonal communication, that relationship that's built with between the, the patient, the client and, and the practitioner and helping them be able to show that they have significant amount of agency and significant amount of uh, power to be able to create a drastic amount of change into their health and well-being. Yeah, beautiful, beautifully said. Um, when it comes to, to variables, um, can you just go out and buy anything? Uh, and whilst we're saying we're not making advertisements here, um, there is there are clearly differences uh, between the various things. Um, I think very practically spoken, I mean, there are rings out there. Um, there are um, there are the watches out there. There are strap-on mm-hmm. kind of things out there. Um, I think the reality is it even if we say one is better than the other, you have to see what is your daily life. If you're a very physical man who drives bloody drills all the time, uh, I don't think your, your ring will be will be surviving for such a long time. <laughs> so, you know, it's those kind of things. So what should yeah. people look out for? Uh, what what are the things that you recommend? Oh, that's, that's, that's a great one in the, the way you described it. It's like, yeah, it, it, it's, it's funny because people are like, well, what's the best one out there? I'm like, what do you like? Really, like, you know, like people sometimes, you know, I'll say a watch, like, I don't want to wear watches. Okay, well, then you can't go with that one then, right? So it's, so you're, you're going through different, different areas, and it all depends on, on that. So, so we'll talk about uh, level of, of accuracy. We'll kind of go from that standpoint. So we'll talk about that and, and what the level of accuracy is uh, based upon that. Now, and the pros and cons of it. The level of accuracy from a, a chest strap is to be the closest you can from the gold standard, right? So this is where there's various apps that are out there. Um, you know, Elite HRV being a free one if you have a heart rate strap. Um, uh, you can pair that with your phone and, and it's, it's you know, as we've seen the, the heart rate uh, information, heart rate variability data, it's almost perfect in, into that uh, standpoint. Uh, well, there's, there's also a company called HRV for training. Uh, Marco Altini is a, a phenomenal uh, HRV educator um, that he, you can actually use the camera uh, on your phone uh, that, uh, looks at the PPG signal and he's all about data science. He's a data science PhD and he makes sure, and he does the due diligence of his testing. And it's pretty, pretty good in regards to compared to an ECG in regards to that information. Okay. So if you don't want to wear a wearable and you're relatively, uh, on a, a very routine person and you want to be able to find this information, that's an easy way to be able to do that, that, uh, you can kind of get HRV metrics from there and seem to be the most accurate way to be able to do so. The second one, uh, are we are more classified in the wearable space, and this would be uh, um, um, whether straps or rings that don't have a display. Right. So this would be something like the Aura Ring or the ring-based wearable. Um, there's a, the the Whoop or the or the the Bio Strap from from there. Typically, they don't have displays because the main thing is the whole design of the of the technology is about the sensors themselves. Right. So those tend to be in a more in the accurate stand uh, standpoint um, comparatively because it's like you don't have to have numbers or battery light doesn't have to be drained. You have to decrease the quality of the sensors to be able to to uh, take the battery life away by having that display uh, mechanism. So those tend to progress quicker uh, in regards to its data accuracy. Uh, uh, and the two that I like, uh, one is Aura Ring, which I'm I'm wearing on my finger as of, as of right now uh company uh from there and the second one is a company called biostrap uh they were clinically designed uh wrist-based wearable 
uh, that is purely uh, about data quality. So those two companies, for me, from an uh, um, accuracy standpoint, are are the the top of the food chain. If you want to wear wearables, one's a ring based. So if you don't like rings, you got the wrist based with the the bio strap. Then it comes to smart watches, right? And this is very similar where Garmin sits. It's in the smart watch category or these type of activity trackers like a Fitbit. Um, the amount of times early on with Fitbit that people would come to me and be like, I was reading my book and my Fitbit said my heart rate was 200 beats a minute. I think I'm having a heart attack and I get a stress test. Uh, it got to the point where I was making everybody wear their Fitbits and do a stress test at the same time to kind of give that like, it's like you have to see this, how far. And sometimes literally during exercise, it's like 50, 60 beats different. And so if you can't get heart rate correctly, Good luck trying to get heart rate variability correct. <laughs> so this is where there's a little more fluctuation in the quality of these devices and the oh, sensors, yeah, yeah. right? So we're starting to get there a little bit more, but it's still not not great. Garmin is, uh, for me, is the top of the food chain when it comes mm-hmm. to smart watches mm-hmm. uh, for many different reasons. Uh, and and one, of the, one of the reasons is that their integrations with other type of technology, which I absolutely love, is the fact you can pair it with different things and, mm-hmm. and have different... Um, integrations uh, from that standpoint. Two, they actually bought a company in 2020 uh, called First Beat. And First Beat was one of the leaders of corporate wellness. Uh, and they, they had an ECG device that you, you would do and mo- measure heart rate variability, almost like a like a Holter monitor uh, to a degree uh, that was wow. commercialized to, to help with stress management. And so they bought them. And ever since that acquisition, I have tested out a few of the garments and they've done phenomenally uh, nice. in regards to the data quality coming through. So I'm super nice. pumped uh, that what they're doing. Nice. In that standpoint, I'd say the number one question is, what well, what about Apple Watch uh, that I get a lot? Um, and again, they're probably like they're probably the one company that has the most amount of display features uh, of any wearable that are out there. You can do so many things with it and that type of stuff. So sensor quality is not there at their forefront. Okay. And if they do calculate heart rate variability, their sample rate is quite low. Uh, they probably get anywhere from about three to five actual measurements of heart rate variability through the nighttime. And that's be highly dependent on what sleep cycle you're in and like so many different factors from that standpoint, <laughs> where you look at the Garmin, you look at the Aura, you look at like some of these other wearables, they're capturing, you know, 60, 90, 100 different samples uh, nice. through the nighttime. Nice. Right. So you're looking at sniffing the larger data set and you start to see trends a little bit more into what's going on. So that's kind of the lay of the land uh, nice. of those things nice. uh, as to what's going on. Now, what I find for, for clients that I see, people that have suffered from chronic conditions, I want out of sight, out of mind. So I always try to recommend a wearable or a smartwatch because it's a passive catcher. They don't actually actively have to do anything. Right. They can just wake up, pair it, and I get the information. Fantastic. And so compliance is super high, which, is, as we know, is a gigantic factor into trying to be able to improve health and well-being. I want to know that if they go out and have a couple of drinks and things like that, I want that information where before people were like, well, I don't want to take it in the morning because I know how bad it's going to be. I'm like, well, I don't know how bad it's going to be. I want to be able to see this number, to see this information. They would actively not do it hmm. just so they wouldn't have to see the, the poor value. So having this passive capture, it's no option. It's already done. It's already calculated. And I get the numbers. And, and so it's, it, it provides a lot more clarity around the, the person. Nice, 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 nice. Makes a lot of sense. So therefore, I mean, since I am wearing a Garmin, um, the the it's now not specifically going into one brand, but um, when you look at it, will be the same problem with many brands, is what I'm alluding to. Um, when it comes to actually getting the data, um, uh, Garmin has a Garmin Connect uh, app that you can get a quick snapshot. It is supposed to be a heart rate variability and gives you a bit of percentages, and that's about it. So, um, how do you get the hard data? How do you get for you to 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 the meat of of the substance? Yeah, so there's a lot of great ways in order to be able to do that. What's phenomenal about a lot of these wearables and a lot of these technologies is that they have what they call open APIs. So uh, 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 the, the back end of things can be accessed by uh, by people. Oh. So uh, there's various softwares that are out there. Uh, when it comes to functional medicine, uh, probably the most predominant one that's out there that I know is called Heads Up Health. Um, they're a company, again, no affiliation to them. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they uh, partner with all these type of, of wearable products out there, whether it's Garmin, whether it's Aura, and you can be able to, to pull that data into a, into a dashboard that you can be able to, to, to see. Hmm. Um, so from, from my back end, uh, I have a startup company where uh, we access all these APIs and I can pull in this data and this information right. to see that independent of, of what wearable they have. So if, even if they have a Fitbit, it's not great, I know. 
Uh, but the fact that I can still pull that data, I can still pull the Oura Ring data, I still pull the Garmin data and be able to pull that in makes it uh, significantly easier for, for practitioners rather than saying, hey, can you give me your username and password and sign into their account or whatever necessarily may be and, and pay that. So there's ways for people to access this information from a, it's like a, not an EMR system, but uh, like an online web dashboard portal uh, by various companies that you can actually access not only, you know, wearable data, but, yeah. you know, CGMs and lab tests and, and a bunch of different things all, all in one nice. area. Nice, 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 nice. Beautiful. So the technology is out there, um, but it's just something that it is still sort of sitting at the fringes uh, at the moment, at least. Um, and I mean, that's that was the, the reason that I wanted to bring that up and pr bring you in, uh, Greg, because this is such an, uh, a beautiful little thing we can do. But with that, you suddenly get in a glimpse in what is happening within your body. And therefore, from there, you can take it much further. You can actually say, wow, hey, this is cool. I can measure things. So what happens when I actually put focus on rehydration, put focus on, uh, let's say, let's learn how to breathe. Let's do some breath work. And I, I found it amazing to, to see the direct impact, for example, on doing 10, 15 minutes of breath work and to see the, the, the impact on my, on, on the, however uh, your watch calls it, uh, your battery or your body different, battery for garbage. Yeah. Exactly. So yeah. however you look at it, it is, uh, it is beautiful. It put a smile on my face when I saw that dramatic change. And that is oh, something, it's great. isn't it? It's it's wonderful yeah. that we can that we can use things like that to our advantage. Yeah, okay. no, it's that's one of the 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 powerful you know uses of the separate technology is you know I, I say this a lot to to people is that you know there could be some sort of medication there could be some sort of intervention that shows that it works for ninety nine point nine percent of people and absolutely fantastic, right? But what if you're that one person? <laughs> what if you're that point one percent? <laughs> really right? yeah. and i want to know that information that thing because you know you know breathing can be super impactful for some people at certain yeah. times and, and sometimes it may not be the right intervention at that specific time based on other factors that are that are going on like as you yeah. said you know talk about uh you know if you're just kind of naive and you're you're only focused on breathwork and breathwork practitioner and someone feels that their energy levels are low and they don't feel very good in a certain amount of pain you're trying to breathe but they have some sort of you know like the cancer or diabetes going on it's like you're missing a, a part of the the story here and so that's where i want to be to look at that kind of intervention efficacy to to, to what's going on for people of saying i'm going to provide something to them am i actually making rather than waiting six months for a scan or three months for blood work to be done how do i know quicker and more efficiently that yeah. the intervention that i'm giving whatever it may be is actually benefiting that individual and this provides significant amount of feedback on that beautiful 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 what do you think is the future of uh hrv heart rate variability you know, it's it's you know, we're starting to scratch some of the surface, and and one of the more exciting companies that I'm that I'm tracking is um, it's it's uh, a they're kind of on the underground right now, but they're going to come out pretty darn soon um, into what's going on. But um, they're doing some uh, uh, research in a university uh, in Australia where they're looking at at EEG technology and HRV technology to look at can we determine. Uh, uh, the emotional regulation of the individual. Wow. So HRV is a phenomenal uh, metric for um, emotional intensity. Yeah. Right. What it doesn't do a very good job, we don't know of, is emotional valence. Is that a positive or negative type of emotion? Right. Because again, whether our sports team wins or loses elicits a significant amount of intensity of emotion. Of course. But our interpretation of that is completely different. So with their initial research done, and I think it was done about eight people, they were able to predict eight, with 80% accuracy the emotional state of the individual. Wow. And they're based on the machine learning models, and this is purely through HRV capture, that they, they predict if they, can, if they can get, yes, if they can get the right amount of people, they can be 98% accurate. <laughs> wow. Well, that's so we're talking about... Yep. scratching the surface to what's going on there's a lot more that we can do with heart rate variability than wow. than what we can than what we're doing right now wow um 
to a degree, it's exact, exceptionally exciting for me, uh, I have to say. Uh, part of me also says, bloody hell, Big Brother is waiting for that. Give me more of that. Um, that and that's the other piece of this, is mm -hmm. I know this is a significant amount of movement, and, and it's, a, it's a big push in what's going on in regards to this you know, health data and how valuable this health data is into what's going into, into the world. And making sure that there has to be a level of, of trust and comfort with, you know, providing this type of information out to individuals because mm -hmm. we can capture so much information um, from, from this. So there's a lot of skepticism into providing this health data over to these companies, which then could be bought and used for various manipulative type of, of acts. Mm -hmm. So there's there's the, the negative side of it is the fact that, yes, I think it could do so much wonders in regards to understanding of uh, detection of conditions, um, you know, in regards to health span and lifespan and regulating, you know, stressful events and, and we're doing the right type of interventions at the right time and, and warning kind of like a, a little bit of a, a warning sign for us when we're going off the, in the wrong direction um, from that. But with that is obviously the downside of, of what this information in the wrong hands could be utilized to be able to execute. Mm, I love it. And there is no easy answer there. I think it is exciting and it is, uh, I think 99% of the work will be clearly positive for us, but just as much as, as there are concerns about uh, the, our DNA analysis through ancestry, my heritage, et cetera, where is this data going? Uh, and could it be used to maybe say, well, actually we will not employ you because you have got AJLA B27 and therefore now you're at risk for that and that sorry no we don't take you um you know there are all these implications there um i've and it will be incredibly hard because the all of this this research is being done around the world it's often done by companies that are straddling uh, a number of countries therefore there is not one regulator that is responsible for things um there will never be an easy answer and there will all be always be nefarious uh reasons why why things will be while well, data will be mishandled but i think um putting that aside because we can't do much about it um let's embrace the technology because it gives us a direct uh direct access to something that we otherwise have great difficulties measuring and especially it gives us a, a global kind of literally finger on the pulse I, I i know it's 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 corny and it sounds stupid but it is it is it gives us an idea where we are at uh in our in our global health right now right here and that's beautiful oh man no absolutely no i'm super excited for the future in that standpoint because mm. some of the Again, some of the advances you talk about, not just from physiological health, we talk about, you know, the, the psychosocial side of things uh, and what uh, we can do there. And to me, it's breaking down the barriers between all of these, you know, domains of, of health. And I always say this is that the fact that, you know, I don't get to cross reference with a, a lot of psychotherapists or clinical counselors, but I completely understand the value of all that. And, mm -hmm. and the hope with the, what we can do with all this information is we start to collaborate more for the good of the the person good of the people uh to provide more of a collaborative type of health care that's that's truly working on you know all areas of health not just our our what our view of health is fantastic greg you're an amazing man i loved that uh fate god or the spaghetti monster put you on that that track uh where you where you started to look at that because you clearly got infected by this, this enthusiasm and uh, we need people like you who are nerdy and and fun enough to deep dive into a quite a specific subject but then are able to utilize it for the greater good and uh and bring it to now to the to the to the attention of a wider audience and that's 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 what was fun today so Greg, thank you so much. I will look at my watch in a very different way, and I will actually try to to capture the data, not capture, to analyze the data uh, in a more uh, meaningful way. Um, uh, you certainly raised my level of interest and my keenness, uh, so I, I'm very grateful that I, uh, that you came onto my show today. No two ways around. No, and I, and I think you've, you know, I, I I'm loving this kind of 
push now around health and well-being that's happening, you know, through through you know some key thought leaders that are now becoming at the forefront of, of what's going on and people's curiosity around what has now been dubbed health span uh, mm-hmm. and, and longevity. And so yeah, exactly. it's people like you that continue to push this message of, of mm-hmm. whole health and the complexities and trying to get people educated and move forward and better understand it all. Absolutely. It's people like you that are going to make the, the real big change for, for individuals. So thank you for, for uh, um, <laughs> doing this, uh, this podcast and sending all the information out there. I think it's extremely valuable and I'm, I'm, uh, I'm excited to be a part of it. Brilliant. Greg, you're an amazing man. Thank you so much for coming onto my show. And you guys out there, look after yourself, live with passion. Bye. <laughs> I never give up. I never give up. I never give up. Turn around.